Okay, we'll go ahead and get started and people are still trickling in here, but that's fine. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. We have a, another webinar in the Opus Connect webinar series for you on understanding collateral in the current environment. But before we get to that discussion, I have a few housekeeping things that we'd like to get through and I'll try to move through them quickly. My name is Lena Dobrier and I am the director uh, of operations at Opus Connect. We are a lower middle and middle market M&A focused organization. Uh, we are membership based. We have chapters in Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York where we do monthly financial seminars. And in addition to those, we do deal sourcing events kind of all around the country when we're, when we're a little more flexible in movement. Um, so if you're interested in learning a bit more about Opus Connect, Please feel free to reach out to my colleague, Jacob Zephyrin. His contact information is below and he'll be, uh, he'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. As we move along in today's discussion, our panel will be answering live Q&A. So there's a uh, box at the bottom of your screen labeled Q&A. Just submit your answers, I'm sorry, your questions there and our moderator will field those. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Uh, so as they come to mind, type them in and we'll address them live. Um, these events would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. So I definitely want to give each of them an opportunity to introduce themselves and say a few words. Uh, four degrees. I'm looking for Ablorde, but I'm not sure that he's in here. Uh, so we'll move along to the next one, but I do want to acknowledge them. And before we, we turn the conversation over, I'll see if he's joined. Uh, next is Alliant. Is Fran or Nathan in here? I don't believe so. Uh, Alliant Insurance, they are a one of our Chicago sponsors. Happy to have them on board and appreciate their support. We'll move forward here. Baker Tilly, I'm not sure if we have anyone. You know, it's a good thing. People are starting to get a little busy, so uh, I'm not mad. Let's acknowledge them, Baker Tilly, uh, CPA sponsor in Chicago. We'll move on to the next. Is Steve Finder in here? Yes, Steve is here of Focus Search Partners. Uh, I'll go ahead and unmute you, Steve. Please introduce yourself and your firm. Hi, thanks, Lena. Um, Steve Finder with Focus Search Partners. Uh, we've got basically two sides to the firm. We have a strategy arm and, that works on operational efficiencies with CEOs and CFOs uh, and technology. And then we have a retained executive search arm that helps uh, healthcare, technology, industrial, and some other uh, sectors with uh, middle and senior level hiring. And we're in offices, uh, nine offices around the country with private equity ownership and uh, very happy to be here. So thanks for including us today, Lena. Absolutely, thank you. Um, if any of our other sponsors are in here, please raise your hand. I don't see Nick though, Resourceive. We definitely want to acknowledge them. And lastly, but not least, Brian Cave, Leighton Paisner. We would be in their offices were it not for the current circumstances. Uh, so I want to acknowledge Brian Cave and, and I'll allow Eric to introduce himself in the firm once we get to him. He's a panelist on today's panel. Uh, but before we get to that discussion, we have two poll questions that we like to ask, uh, and we would um, encourage your participation here. We'd like to know how you heard about today's event. So you'll see that uh, pop-up box launch there, and if you could just submit your answer, that would be helpful for us. Thank you. We'll give it about another 10 seconds or so and then we will move on great uh, so it looks like many of you heard about the event from us which is awesome linkedin our efforts are working some support from our sponsors and speakers so thank you so much again for that uh, we'll move on to the second question and final question for now. This is helpful for us internally, but also for our panel to understand who's in the audience today, who they'll be addressing. Uh, so mark your answers here and we'll give it about another 10 seconds or so and we will move forward. Great. 
Um, so it looks like some independent sponsors, 9%, 15% investment bankers. We have capital providers on the debt side, which is great. Capital providers on the equity side and some service providers. So uh, panelists take note, that's who you'll be speaking to today. And without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, uh, Dan Arnold of Hillco. Thank you so much for moderating today's webinar and I'll I'll bow out and kick it over to you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Lena. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. I know it's crazy time, so we appreciate you taking the time out of uh, out of your day, wherever you are, and, uh, and joining this discussion. I think we've got a, a great panel lined up in what should be an interesting and very timely discussion. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dan Arnold. Uh, I'm a senior vice president at Hilco Global. I sit at our holding company. Hilco Global is a... Uh, a group of um, business units. We've got about 24 operating units um, that all focus largely on assets. And what do we do with those assets? We value them. So we're the largest asset-based appraisal company globally, but we also buy and sell them opportunistically, buying them for our own account with our own capital and selling them as an agent or a broker. And uh, we have a bunch of adv related advisory businesses as well. Um, we deal a lot with the lending space. Uh, we have a lot of uh, subject matter experts in the asset, uh, in different asset classes across all our businesses. And so we wanted to bring together an interesting panel to talk about today what collateral looks like with respect to the values of that collateral, uh, how lenders are viewing that, um, how advisory companies, restructuring advisory companies are working with uh, with different businesses to leverage that collateral and then discuss all the legal implications around that. And so we put together a nice panel that I wanna introduce. Uh, I'll introduce everybody uh, individually, let them tell a little bit about themselves and then we'll jump in uh, to the discussion. So first up on the, uh, on the panel list is Adam Evans. Adam, uh, or I'm sorry, Derek Martin, we'll go in order of the slides. Uh, Derek is, uh, a managing director at Portage Point Partners, and I'll kick it over to Derek to tell you a little bit about himself and his business. Hi, Dan, thank you. And um, most importantly, thank you for in inviting me and including me in this great uh, event today. So uh, as, Dan, as Dan described, uh, Portage Point's a, a middle market uh, turnaround and restructuring and performance improvement ad advisory firm. I'm a managing director and lead our, our West Coast region have 20 years of experience um, across all aspects of restructuring and industries, whether that is uh, telecommunications, aviation, uh, real estate, hospitality, manufacturing, or, or technology. Uh, prior to Portage, I spent 14 years at A&M as a managing director in their restructuring group, and then began my career at uh, Deloitte in their uh, turnaround and restructuring practice as well, all, all here in the Bay Area. Thanks, Dan. Great, next up we've got uh, one of my colleagues, Adam Evans. Adam is a senior member of our appraisal team and I'll kick it over to him. Looks like Adam might be frozen at the moment. So I will hold off on uh, kicking it over to Adam. Um, why don't we go to the next one and Lena, hopefully we can come back to Adam when he gets back on. Uh, so David Ellis is uh, one of the founders of GemCap. Um, and I'll let David uh, tell you a little bit about himself and his business. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Jim Cap is an asset-based lender. We make senior loans up to $10 million. We also factor. We tend to specialize in inventory, equipment, and receivables, but we also finance intellectual property and real estate. Uh, we are nationwide, and um, it's very interesting times here in the lower mid-market. Thanks, Dan. And last but not least, we have our panelists and also one of our sponsors, Eric Prezant. Uh, Eric and Hilco have a long and very strong relationship and he's a partner at Brian Cave and I'll let him tell you a little bit about it. Yeah, hi, thanks, Dan. Uh, Eric Prezant, I'm, I'm a partner with Brian Cave, Leighton Paisner. Uh, we're a full service uh, law firm, both in the US as well as uh, we, we have offices throughout the world. Uh, and in particular in Europe, uh, you know, my, my focus and, and my team focuses on, on middle market transactions, both on the asset side and the real estate side. 
Uh, I, I tend to say I do dirty m and I do a lot of deals that involve uh, distressed and, and uh, assets of all sorts, including, including dirty real estate and, and dirt, dirty assets. So um, we try and come up with creative solutions uh, throughout, um, you know, a, any kind of troubled situation and also, uh, you know, financing that ties in with those kinds of transactions. So thank you uh, for inviting me to this panel and uh, looking forward to this group. And Lino, maybe we'll go back to Adam. It looks like he's uh, back online. Yeah, I am. Sorry about that. It was a strange internet disconnect. Um, hope everybody's safe and sound. Uh, thank you all for uh, for joining us today. Thanks, Dan, for having me. Um, so I'm Adam Evans. Um, I've been with Hilco for going on uh, 20 years now. Uh, all of my time in the valuation business, I started as an appraiser, an industrial appraiser for Hilco. Did that for a number of years and then moved into the business development side of the world and managed um, multiple territories for Hilco, including the West and Southwest. I now focus on the Canadian and Northeast territories, um, supporting the valuation business um, and some other Hilco businesses. So happy to be here today. Great. Well, appreciate everybody for, uh, for those comments. And uh, I do think we have a really great group here, a group of folks who are definitely very candid and open with, uh, with how they uh, will share with us today. And so what I wanted to do for this panel is really walk through the life cycle of collateral from a lending perspective. So starting with the appraisal, moving through to the lenders, uh, you know, hopefully nobody has to deal with this, but workouts are a part of life, uh, especially in this environment. And so understanding what those look at like today and kind of bringing, uh, Eric in throughout the discussion to get a legal perspective on all of that. And uh, the goal is for this to be a very open and organic conversation. So we'll see where it takes us, but uh, to all the uh, audience members out there and the participants, please uh, feel free to click on that um, Q and A link at the bottom and type in a question. And when we're done with the discussion, we'll have, uh, we'll have some time for Q and A and try to answer those as well. So with that said, I'm gonna start, kick it off uh, on the appraisal side where all uh, lending collateral begins. And maybe Adam, I'll just ask you a very open-ended question to start, uh, just given that we're in a weird time, when we look at things today, how are appraisal values holding up? I know that's somewhat of a loaded question, but maybe you can get into some of the specifics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it really depends on, on asset classes. Um, you know, I would say if you're looking at inventory as collateral, um, you know, depending on the type of inventory, some of it's holding up very well, right? So if you're in food processing or you're selling into grocery, for example, um, you know, the inventory is turning very quickly. The inventory is holding up well. If you're selling paper products, tissue products, things like that, the inventory is likely being utilized and turning very well, which, which means that it would recover, you know, very well should you need to liquidate it. It's when you get into industries that are, are not doing as well, right? So if you're if you're just talking about oil and gas inventory, so oil country, tubular goods, OCTG, pipes, valves, and fittings, things like that, that's an industry that is, uh, is, is the inventory would not be recovering all that well. Automotive, um, you know, industries that are that are in the bubble, the, the inventory is not doing that well. Machinery and equipment, um, you know, given that we're nine, 10 weeks into this, there hasn't been, there hasn't been a lot of machinery and equipment sales or liquidations to, to point to for comparable sales. So, I mean, there's been some auctions of transportation assets and things, and the recoveries are down, um, you know, maybe 20, 25%. Um, we feel like, you know, when the, when the economy starts to open back up and you can have machinery equipment auctions for manufacturing assets, you'll likely see the value some, be somewhere in the possibly 30% lower range from what they were. Um, this could be from, OEMs reducing the cost of new assets because they're sitting on so much inventory. It could be because of a glut of equipment that's going to be coming on the market because of a you know increased number in a you know a lot of liquidations that have been pent up that could happen. So there's a, there's a few things that could happen there. But um, you know it's it's there, there there hasn't been enough kind of data transactions for you to 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 really put a fine point on it. So as, as you look at the activity that you're seeing right now, are you getting a lot of calls from lenders to update appraisals, put out new appraisals? What's been the activity that you've seen recently? 
Yeah, we're still doing appraisals and we're still getting calls to do appraisals, both new appraisals and then updating um, appraisals for, for, existing, for existing accounts. Um, in some cases, we've seen lenders or equity holders or, you know, or other you know, constituents postpone getting the appraisals done for a couple of reasons. One of them is because they're, you know, they're waiting to see what the company's going to look like as this comes out, you know, as it, you know, as it extends out and the economy opens back up. Um, it could be that they're, you know, a company that's maybe a, a retailer, for example, that doesn't have any stores open. And so they, you know, they don't, no sense in doing an appraisal right now when there's no stores open. So they're waiting to see, you know, after a certain percentage of stores open back up for a period of time, they'll, they'll have the appraisals done then. Um, as far as new appraisals, uh, we've seen new appraisals come in from, from asset-based lenders. We've seen, you know, had a lot of conversations and calls with um, commercial lenders who have cash flow loans that they're looking to possibly convert to an asset base structure. So they're calling us to say, hey, if this does go to ABL, what do you think the inventory is going to look like? What could it support for the equipment side? So we're, we're having calls with some of the kind of non-traditional appraisal users, whether they're, you know, private debt funds or commercial lenders, and then, you know, our existing, our existing clients as well. Um, so with as it relates to the process of appraisals and operationally speaking, obviously travel is very limited now. I know Hillco traditionally likes to actually go and visit locations, put eyes on things. How are we doing things differently and how do we manage that from a process standpoint? Yeah, I, you know, it, it's, it's changed um, a lot. I mean, for inventory appraisals, you know, we've, we've moved and technology has allowed us to do things more remotely. So, well, nothing, nothing takes the place of kind of going to a facility and, and really, you know, inspecting the inventory and seeing the process and, you know, blowing the dust off of uh, uh, boxes and opening up to see, you know, if there's aged inventory in it or something like that. We're doing a lot of that remotely and technology allows us to do virtual, some virtual inventory inspections and say, hey, can you, uh, you know, open the box on the top shelf or, you know, management interviews, you know, things are being done remotely. Um, we're doing some appraisals on the equipment side where we're issuing them as a draft report. And then there'll be a future site inspection where we can go in and then it'll be issued as a final report. Um, you know, it could be things where, you know, if a, a facility is closed for a number of months, um, you know, preventive, preventive maintenance and things kind of go by the wayside. So machines that are used to running all the time and keeping lubricant and things going through them, um, if you're not doing that for several months, it can have an effect on the assets. So we want to be able to take a look at those assets and. Um, you know, really, you know, things that are going to be real determinants of value there. So, you know, for real estate, for example, you know, we've seen certain jurisdictional regions kind of lessen the requirements for full inspections. So some places are allowing us to do a desktop only appraisal. Um, some are saying you can do it just with an exterior inspection only. Um, so, you know, there's changes there. I will say in the last, you know, week, we've started kind of slowly moving back to doing some site inspections on a case-by-case -case basis. So we had appraisers in facilities last week in a couple of different states. So it's, you know, it, as we're allowed to do it more as jurisdictions open back up and as companies are, you know, the willingness is there to have us go into the facility to look at the assets or inventory. I mean, we'll go by whatever guidelines are, are put together there, but uh, you know, we're, we're ready to go when they are. Great. No, that, that's, that's very interesting. And Eric, I might kick it over to you for a second now and just talk. So as collateral values adjust and earnings adjust to the new realities out there, um, obviously you have a situation where loans might be coming into technical default. People might be missing payments. I'm curious what you're seeing from a lender or borrower perspective. Um, or how are they responding to this and how are they dealing with technical defaults or missed payments or things like that? Yeah, so uh, I, I think that story is is still evolving at this point. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. I think overall uh, lenders have tended to uh, take a wait and see approach. And while there are certainly um, you know a lot of missed uh, you know required principal and interest payments, and some maturities that are that are occurring. I think there's a reality of the situation that um, lenders aren't really sure uh, what to do. And actually, I think some from an internal perspective, a lot of the banks and lenders that I work with, you know, they're still getting some direction internally in terms of how to deal with some of these issues. 
So, uh, you know, a lot of borrowers are, are, are asking proactively uh, for, you know, uh, deferrals or, uh, or, or some other kind of relief. Uh, at least generally speaking, they, they're, they're tending to get those right now, and lenders are not um, tripping folks up on, you know, technical defaults or, or even miss, you know, missed interest and in principal payments, um, you know, and, and there's, it seems to be a current, uh, you know, a, a general request by borrowers to extend out through the remainder of the year it tends to be a, a, a request that people ask for. Um, you know, lenders, at least the ones that I'm uh, talking to, you know, aren't willing to typically go out that far for most of their borrowers. I think they want to take a look and, and see how the situation evolves uh, based on the market. So, uh, you know, a lot of the deferrals I'm seeing are, are for, for, you know, two or three months, not the rest of the year. Um, but there's not a huge appetite that I've seen so far for lenders to uh, come in and 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 really uh, you know come down hard on borrowers and I think we could probably as this conversation evolves we can talk a little more about why that would be um, but that that's basically what I'm seeing in the marketplace. And are those deferrals being formally documented as amendments to lending agreements or how is that working from a legal perspective? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Uh, mostly yes. I mean they are certainly. Um, you know, forbearance agreements or loan amendments or extensions. I mean, there are several on my desk right now that are in default. And in, I would say in typical days, uh, a, a lender would um, not, you know, be comfortable with it not being documented. You know, it, they, they'd want something, you know, kind of in writing. Um, I, I do think there's a little bit of a backlog. So there's a few uh, that I'm working on that, you know, there, it's just people are taking it on faith right now, and that it, you know, and as the lender runs it through their internal processes to get to get ex, to get extensions. You know, the interesting part, and it ties in with what what Adam was saying, is you know the internal struggles that that a lot of lenders deal with is you know do they need to, for example, get updated personal financial statements in order to give kind of relief? You know, a lot of them have policies and programs in place where. They really want or require that kind of stuff, um, and borrowers right now are very resistant to provide that. And the values of some of the assets that were previously on personal financial statements, they don't really want to do a new one, uh, and it's really difficult for them to determine what the values of some of the things that you know they otherwise counted as value, whether it be um, you know stocks or, or other interests in, in closely held companies or real estate or you know, whatever else they you know, they are sort of basing the valuation on. So there's a tension of, you know, you know, do, you know, how do I provide information to my lender? Uh, you know, and the lenders, some of them are saying, you know, we need this. We can't internally extend out unless we have updated information. Borrowers are fairly resistant to that. Uh, so therein lies some of these deals where it's kind of sitting out there. So it's, it's a little bit of a standstill going on right now, um, and and you know, and they're not documented. Well, look, I think we're only two months into this thing, so you know, folks have missed two payments at most, maybe one. So obviously, it's going to evolve uh, pretty rapidly. Well, while we're talking about lenders, we might as well talk to uh, the resident lender in our group, David. So as you look out at what's going on right now. You know, you are a, a pure asset-based lender. How do you view collateral different today than you did say three, four, five, six months ago? Well, I think going to what Adam had said earlier, you know, all collateral isn't, isn't created equal, right? And so, so we're definitely looking at different classes of collateral whether it's going to be, you know, is it collateral that's currently in a retail store that nobody can get to because it's shut down, it's just aging there, or is it uh, collateral that's going into the food supply uh, chain? Is it collateral that's in the energy sector that uh, nobody knows when there's going to be a buyer for that again, or is it, you know, collateral that is uh, basic consumer goods that's turning on an e-commerce site? So there, there's no, I say we're looking at collateral differently. We've always looked at collateral very closely depending on its turn, its categories. 
th those categories have taken different meaning now. Um, and I think the biggest thing that we're looking at collateral differently is that, you know, at the heart of asset-based lending are the assets. And the idea is if somebody doesn't perform on their loan, that ultimately you could take that asset and sell it. And that's actually not the case today, right? You have a company that um, is shut down effectively and their customers are shut down and you're not allowed to travel to go get that asset. So it's, it's a very different world. Uh, it, if you were allowed to travel to get that asset, you go there and then, but there's no customers to buy it right now because they can't travel to come and see it. So it's, um, it's, it's a very interesting world. I mean, fortunately, our portfolio has been performing fairly well. Uh, but, but we've been running through a lot of what if scenarios, like I think a lot of lenders are. Uh, so the biggest difference is how do you manage uh, out a wind down scenario if you have to uh, in this new COVID environment that we're in? So as you look at the different types of uh, borrowers that you're talking to, have you seen a change in the folks that are approaching you right now? Are you seeing an increase in retailers or consumer products companies who are struggling more uh, in this environment coming to you guys because obviously banks are going to be a tougher sell for them right. than you had in the past we've um we've had a big change we, we first of all a lot of prospects that would be going to a regulated lender meaning you know a bank are now coming to private lenders like us because they're saying that either the bank is not making a loan or it's gonna to take too long. Uh, so we're seeing actually better credits. Uh, we are also seeing, not to everybody's surprise, a rush of um, uh, people in the energy sector, uh, people that, that we're just, I have no idea how to value that asset, neither does anybody else right now. And so we're, we're getting a rush of what I'll call unfinanceable loans. But, but we are getting um, a lot of unique opportunities too where borrowers are coming in and saying look there was five of us now there's three I'm getting uh, I'm getting more business now I need growth capacity or I see a great acquisition opportunity and I want to leverage my app assets to be able to do this acquisition so we're seeing it's it's not unlike 09 and 10 to tell you the truth all of a sudden there are players out there that see opportunity and they're coming to for for debt to finance them and are people looking to move fast? Are you guys able to move as fast as people are looking to need? Obviously, liquidity is uh, challenging for a lot of folks right now. Right. Um, like all of these, there's no, there's no clear cut answer to that. You know, the challenge is, uh, and again, it goes back to something like Adam was saying, how, how do you close a new loan if it has assets that you really need to see and inspect before you you do that. I mean, if it's, if it's just receivables, that's rather easy, right? You know, you can, you can verify shipping, you can verify bank accounts. You can, you can, you can do a lot of your audit remotely, but actually going in and looking at inventory and equipment is, is challenging right now. Um, there, there have been honestly anything that we're really looking at to move forward today that has a lot of tangible uh, assets, meaning, primarily equipment and, and inventory, uh, we might come in with a very low advance rate. And then uh, post COVID where we can actually go out and inspect and, and do it, then we, we can increase it. And, and we lay that out saying, hey, look, the uh, desktop appraisal, uh, like that Adam referred to, uh, you know, it's coming in here. We're going to do a much lower percentage of that because we haven't been able to inspect. Uh, but we will, uh, uh, post COVID, when we can come out and do an inspection, then we will increase it accordingly. So that's interesting because, uh, we were working on a deal recently, a uh, big company where the lenders and these are banks essentially said, we'll give you a smaller amount up front, um, pre finalizing the appraisal and finalizing the field exam. And then would increase that to the, you know, normal advance rate once we can complete that on-site diligence. Is that a tack that you guys are taking and that you're seeing a lot of other lenders do? It, it is, I don't know if a lot of lenders are doing it, but I assume it's, it's kind of the new normal now. If, if you're going to do any business at all, 
and you actually physically can't get out and see everybody, then how are you going to do it? And, and what you do is you hedge your risk, right? And you say, I'm going to give you a lower advance rate. Uh, and then I will make up for that in the future when we can take this uncertainty away. Uh, you know, it's, it's not unlike we have borrowers, for example, that, that supply retailers. Well, you know, right now you're worried about the receivables that you're going to be getting on the other end, not just from the large retailers, but from especially the smaller ones. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're hedging with them. You, we have to go and make this decision. Do you actually say, I'm not funding you anymore, which is legitimate in today's environment, or I'm going to go out and get credit insurance. And if I can't get credit insurance, then I'm going to give you a much lower advance rate. We've done that with some of our, our borrowers who supply the retail industry, particularly a lot of small mom and pop retailers where I'm just going, I don't know how that can how you can judge how, what their financial wherewithal is going to be when it comes time to pay that receivable. So we're either giving them, you know, where it used to be, we would be somewhere between 80 to 90% advance rate on these receivables. Maybe now we're between 30 and 60 or zero and 60%, depending on who the retailer is. But if we can ensure them, we're still advancing up to the 80 to 90. And that way it's, it's mitigating everybody's risk, our risk and our borrower's risk. So, on the advance rate side, one thing that I found is interesting, and specifically with uh, with retailers, right? You have a an interesting dynamic right now where retailers, consumer products companies, are flush with inventory that's very seasonal and that's going to be out of season very soon, and we're going to have this glut of this type of inventory in the marketplace. How are you evaluating that? Right? Normally, it would be anything that's over a year old is not eligible. Well, now might be way less than a year old, but if it's out of season and there's a risk to it, how do you guys assess that? Uh, we have a, a couple of different situations. I mean, obviously there's, there's uh, industrial inventories, which uh, have largely, depending on the sector, but ours have largely not been impacted by the COVID shutdown. When you're really talking about consumer inventory, uh, you have, uh, um, you know, the, the worst case scenario, which is that you have retail shops that have seasonal items in them that nobody are able to, to get to. So on, on those, we have uh, fortunately been able with our borrowers to work with them and say, what additional collateral do you have uh, so that we can keep this going on? And we've been able to get additional collateral, either for personal collateral or, or other business collateral, uh, knowing that they, along with a myriad of other retailers are going to have to dump this inventory afterwards. So the prices are going to be much lower. Uh, so we've been trying to work with borrowers to shore up and say, how can we work something out over time? But you have to give us extra collateral to do that. Um, on the opposite side, we have e-commerce uh, businesses that have, again, a myriad of, of varied collateral and they're doing gangbusters. We've even increased advance rates there. But even in that sector right now, because, uh, we are watching literally on a skew by skew basis on how they're turning their inventory because we don't want them to get over anxious and buy a ton of inventory. And then because they're, they're thinking the market's just going to keep going up for them and then all of a sudden have it slow down in its turn. So we're being cautious. We're monitoring more than uh, we ever have in the past. We're just monitoring everything uh, to a great degree. Uh, and that's how we're trying to mitigate the risk in this and also to give opportunity. I want to touch back on something you mentioned before, which was credit insurance. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys seeing an active marketplace there? Are you guys able to find insurers who are able to underwrite and actually write policies on, uh, on some of your borrowers? Yeah, we have, we have, we had prior to COVID existing policies in place that we could use uh, across our, our borrowers. I, I don't know what the market is like if you were trying to get new credit right now. Uh, fortunately, our policies have been good and are still enacting and they're still giving credit. And if they don't give credit, that tells us something as well. Do we want to take that receivable uh, if, uh, if it's uninsurable? It's like my, my, uh, my brother used to do a lot in the oil and gas business. And back in the eighties, he was, uh, having to go to Colombia a lot, but that was in Colombia is not 
so good days. And all of a sudden he couldn't get kidnap insurance. And I said, do you really want to travel to a place if you can't get kidnap insurance? So I kind of asked the same question. Do I really want to finance a receivable if I can't get any insurance on it, no matter what the cost? The answer is probably, you know, no. Fair enough. Um, Derek, I want to switch over to you a little bit now. First, I'm going to open, ask a pretty open-ended question, but being in the restructuring advisory business, how have you seen business the last two months? Have you seen a massive pickup or are you guys just is the phone ringing off the hook? Yeah, it, um, it's, it's interesting. Is business certainly has, has picked up significantly. And what I'd say is the, uh, also the, the call volume has been tremendous, but we, we kind of look at it and break it down is the business is still coming from, from the usual suspects with which, you know, everyone has anticipated throughout this process. I mean, those industries where the revenue has effectively stopped and gone to zero, right? Aviation, travel, and hospitality. And then from the other aspect is where, where this situation has really pushed those industries over the edge, you know, those being retail and, and oil and gas. And then to where the call volume, the call volume is just coming from every nook and cranny throughout, you know, throughout our economy, and whether that is manufacturing, agriculture, service businesses, entertainment, or any business that is impacted by not having, not being able to having, you know, a large gathering of either customers or employees. But what I'd say is, you know, those calls are happening, but there's no, you know, there's no business yet from our standpoint and you know that's just because of, of the level of, of uncertainty in, in terms of how this thing's gonna gonna play out and ultimately impact their business and so as you right a big part of your job is obviously helping folks work through balance sheet issues what has the conversations with the lenders been like to date and obviously you're seeing it from a different angle than uh, than some of the other folks here representing the actual borrowers and talking on behalf of the borrowers, what, what, what have you noticed that's changed over the last couple of months? Yeah, it, it's a, it, there's been a, a tremendous amount of, of uncertainty and also wait and see approach. I mean, our view relative to whether it's a, a liquidation or, or turnaround really hasn't changed because of right, that, that level of uncertainty that exists. And, and, and to my mind, right, and the uncertainty and, and the options is, you know, folks, right, aren't, aren't going to know. And, you know, the, the process will continue to play out in terms of a, right, what can they raise in terms of the, the capital markets? I mean, as, as we've seen, the corporate debt markets are open for certain people, right? Expedia just raised, you know, over, over 3 billion, we all know about Boeing's uh, 25 billion, Airbnb raised a, a billion, right, N Nike six. The, the corporate debt markets, I think, you know, in terms of the, the amount of money that's been raised over the last you know, month has been doubled this year versus last year. And this, the second kind of pillar to that is just the level of, of government programs that are out there and the potential, you know, for these borrowers just to get funding. I mean. It's, it's crazy to think as you kind of add them all up that 1.8 uh, trillion under, under the CARES Act, that was you know, almost two and a half times the, the bailout package in 2000, uh, 2009, right? The House just passed the, you know, the 3 trillion package, right? To support you know, uh, local, state, and governments, right? Additional checks for individuals and then extending the unemployment benefits you know, out, out into January, you know, in addition to that, all, all the Fed uh, buying programs for corporate debt. Just today, there was an article out there in the, the Wall Street Journal to really focus on the middle market borrowers, those that are too big for the PPP program, but also uh, too small for, for some of the other big um, uh, Fed programs that are out there. And then the, the third kind of aspect is just the general uncertainty in terms of how this actually plays out, right? When are we gonna reopen our economy? How fast is it gonna recover? When are we gonna get a, um, a potential cure for the virus? So all of that has just led to, you know, a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And as right, Adam and, and Eric and David is, you know, a, a general wait and see approach as to how this plays out over the next couple of months. So have you seen with a lot of your clients, um, some of these government programs really stepping in and helping the short-term liquidity issues that this has caused? 
Yeah. So what um what we've seen as 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 a potential to be able to step in, um, you know, most of our clients have not gotten you know just because there's size direct funding as of yet, but certainly those discussions are being had and money is is potentially on the table, but funds haven't you know funds haven't come across the um, the, the table as of yet, which you know extends the process and extends the uh, the, the uncertainty and. Um, you know the, the the potential options that are that, that are out there. But do they feel like they're going to get approved for this stuff? Have they been managing through the bureaucracy? That you know, absent the actual funding, does it yep. look like you know? Do people have confidence that they're this is going to come through in a timely enough manner that they'll be able to manage their liquidity situation? Yeah, they are cautiously optimistic. Yeah, and that the, you know the the vast majority of them feel that way. And so you, you touched uh, for a second on, you know, workout versus liquidation. And obviously the world has changed a lot and there is a lot of uncertainty, but has this affected any companies in a way that you, where you've said, you know what, whereas a couple of months ago, we maybe could have saved this thing. Now there's no chance. Let's just, you know, pull the plug faster yeah. and stench the bleeding. Yeah. And, you know, for, I know for certain industries, you know, that's that certainly changed that 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 paradigm for for our clients. It's really taken the wait and see approach where that's, you know, that that's going to play out over, over the next couple months. But just with all the uncertainty with which I described that's out there and, you know, the the, the potential le uh, levers to pull, um, you know, we really haven't seen for, for our kind of client base, you know, that kind of paradigm shift to look, we just need to liquidate this thing now. And so what, what structures have, fun, have some of your clients used to help manage through this and work with their lenders? Are, are people filing bankruptcy? Are they trying to do workouts outside of bankruptcy? Um, maybe we'll get into Eric a little bit more what the courts are uh, able to process, but curious where, where your clients are leaning towards and how they're managing it. Yeah, and great, great question. I mean, everyone is generally focused on, you know, purely solving the capital structure and, and balance sheet problem. And uh, most of them are, are, are hopeful and, you know, there's a decent probability of, of getting a lot of that done out of court. And if it can't get done out of court, everyone is talking about, you know, getting it through a short prepack process. You know, the, 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 the extended duration of, of a traditional chapter 11 isn't really in the vocabulary or, or discussions of any, any of our clients' situations at this point, right? And that, you know, that's primarily because, you know, the, the cost of the exercise, the amount of time and duration that you're, in, that you're in chapter and the potential uncertainty with which that creates. Well, that's a good, good segue to go over to Eric. Eric, what does in court or out of court mean today? Is there anything that's in court? <laughs> Uh, nothing right now that's actually in court, uh, except for some criminal trials, which, you know, under the constitution, you're entitled to a speedy trial, but outside of, outside of that, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm involved in a number of, of, of current matters, both in bankruptcy courts throughout the country, as well as state courts, uh, you know, uniformly, uh, court is happening. These, these matters are moving forward. Uh, it's all being done virtually, just like we're talking right now. Um, so I was on a Zoom call to the Delaware Bankruptcy Court the other day, which was first time I've ever done that. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it's really a, uh, you know, it, it's definitely a, a, a different world. I mean, you know, courts are, are prioritizing, you know, the, the initial, um, uh, activity and uncertainty in terms of, you know, whether courts would be um, open and, and how they would process seems to be running through and, and, and both courts and, and parties to courts are, are recognizing that, you know, you can do a lot of, uh, of, of your business uh, in front of the courts right now. There's even, I haven't done an evidentiary hearing yet in front of courts virtually, but uh, one of my partners just the other day uh, put on evidence virtually in a, in a, in a case. So, those kinds of things do happen. I, I do agree with with Derek that, you know, I think, you know, there is still a worry uh, from, you know, everybody involved how this is going to work from a court uh, perspective, 
And I think that, you know, folks are definitely leaning more towards avoiding uh, processes if they can if they can at this point because you know while you know while I think the courts have been as accommodating as they as they can be under the circumstances there is still it's still very difficult to um, you know get into court and to you know ad address uh, some of the issues that you previously did um, so you know in that respect um, it, you know circumstances have, have certainly changed I think there's also a, a heightened fear and, and a sentiment amongst our, our clients and, and, and borrowers that if under the current environment that they actually file, that their customers and stakeholders are going to feel that, that it's a liquidation, even if you signpost the fact that, you know, this is, you know, this is the solution to the problem. This is a prepack. We're going to, we have this great story. We're deleveraging our balance sheet and coming out as part of NUCO much, you know, um, leaner and, and stronger. Our clients still feel that you know there's just that that sense and, and word of bankruptcy in the current environment is going to lead people mentally down the path that it it must be a li liquidation. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I think that is definitely a sentiment that um, I'm feeling and seeing as well. I mean, it, it, there there is a a question, uh, and really some of the you know the I think the criteria for um, you know whether it's going to be a liquidation or not going to be a liquidation, you know, it's coming down to for for a lot of folks, do they have to put more money into it? So I mean, if if a company even on a more limited basis, you know, is able to defer payments and kind of you know eke their way through to a solution uh, that then you know deals with a you know a, you know a balance sheet that gets right sized or or some other. Um, you know, sale process that was already in the works. I, I think that's something that people can get their heads around and get comfortable with. Um, you know, most of the lenders I talk to uh, are, are fairly uncomfortable with the idea of putting in a lot of new money into these kinds of situations without understanding uh, what's happening here. So they're, you know, to the extent that you're in a situation where you're in an industry where you, you have, you know, you know, either lenders or private equity or just, you know, people who, who run the business who have to write checks themselves, there's a reluctance to do that right now. And, and the, the, the strong preference instead is to, um, you know, cost cut the best you can, cut the best deals with your creditors, landlords, um, suppliers as you possibly can and weather the storm for a few more months to see what happens. And Dan, the other, the other potential wrinkle just in terms of added complexity, which I, I guess it would fall under, under the, the government funding is under the CARES Act, there was also um, the, the ability of, of, of companies to, to carry back certain losses as, as part of this and carry them back four to five years, which would obviously generate significant tax refunds. But it's 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 understanding and crystallizing what those amounts could be and the timing of that just adds a potential additional level uh, lever to pull and complexity in terms of you know how how ultimately the balance sheet and liquidity problem gets solved. And so as you guys and we'll get back to the CARES Act and I think we have a question related to it. Um, but Eric, as as you look at how, what legal actions are being taken? Are you seeing a shift in the type of filings or workouts that, that are materializing right now? It seems like people want to avoid a chapter 11, but what if it is a liquidation? Are they going straight into sevens? Are they liquidating through an 11? Are folks trying to do article nine sales, assignments for the benefit of creditors? How is that playing out? Yeah, so uh, great question. It, you know, I, I've not seen an uptick of sevens yet. And maybe others have on the panel. I, I mean, I, I certainly retail. You know, I think folks have probably been, you know, watching, and and maybe some of the folks either on the panel or in the or or sort of paying attention here are involved in some of them. But um, you know, there's been a you know a whole spate of retail bankruptcies that have recently uh, filed. Um, they they all, to to my knowledge, are Chapter 11s. Um, you, you know, there is an uptick in uh, Article 9 sale activity that I have seen. Uh, it's interesting because there's a real question in, in the Article 9 process in terms of how it's going to work. 
Um, you know, I, you know, it's, it's similar to what I think Adam was talking about at the beginning. I mean, the same issues that you have to appraise, you have to, you know, when you're dealing with an Article 9 process. I mean, you can't go touch and feel the assets. You know, you can't uh, typically gather in a place to actually even conduct an auction. So folks are dealing with how do you do it virtually? You know, how do I know what I'm getting if I'm not actually able to go over there and, and take a look at it and, you know, inspecting, especially if assets are in multiple different places, it creates a, a situation. And there's some case law that is developing now. It's very early stage um, about, you know, the, you know the, the standard for conducting those kinds of sales is, is a commercially reasonable sale process. And are you, you know, are you able to get those kind of values from running a sale process? Um, you know, I, I think you can, uh, you know, but certainly other, you know, other folks don't, you know, don't believe that that's possible or they believe that they're, you're sort of hampered by the current circumstances. So, um, you know, I, so I do think that, you know, to the extent that folks can wait, at least currently, in my experience, they're waiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. I think there's two, two issues here. One is there's a fear of the court system because there's a, this perception at least that there's a backlog. And so if you were to try to seek a remedy through bankruptcy protection, that, that if the, the, the cure might be worse than the illness that you're going to be pushed out forever and ever. And uh, who knows what happens with cash collateral during that time. So people are leaning more toward an article nine. I think to, to Eric's point, there is a lot of ways to be commercially reasonable right now. It does depend on the situation. If you're, you know, if you're selling a mine out in the middle of Montana, it might be very difficult for somebody to come in and bid on that if, if, uh, if without being able to inspect it. But if you're, if you're selling receivables and you have a detailed SKU inventory report and you have things like that, um, I, I, I think that, that there is an argument that it's commercially reasonable versus letting the expenses to carry these assets forward, eat it away. And I don't really see people, I mean, some people argue against everything, but I think that that for the most part, if you conduct a commercially reasonable sale, you advertise it widely, people are going more through that route right now because of the fear of the delay in the court system. And so Eric touched on something, David, that I think was interesting for you. Um, one of the things that's driving decision process now is do lenders need to put in more money? I, I imagine the list of your current borrowers who are asking for more money is probably pretty long. Uh, how are you managing through that and uh, what's driving that decision? It's case by case. Uh, and I'm gonna say it's common sense is dictating the, the outward, as much common sense as you can do with the information that you have right now. I mean, for example, we, ha we have a borrower that uh, supplies athletic jerseys to universities and all of the athletic events have been canceled, right? So, um, uh, you know, we, we really, they were asking for money just to stay afloat during this, and th this is now, you know, coming on two months ago, just to stay alive during this time period. And we said, you know, right now you have good receivables. You have a personal guarantee on this loan. Do you really want us just to keep giving you money? Why don't you just shut down for a couple of months till you know, and then we'll refinance it. You refinance you when you start. So, so it's it's you know there the answer is no. There's other uh, um, businesses like this e-commerce business that I um, mentioned. They they just did a. Uh, they're asking for higher advance rates. We're we're going to have a new appraisal done to see if it justifies that because. Honestly, I'm looking at it, their inventory turn is going higher. They're, okay, fine. We have other um, uh, borrowers who are in more troubled industries and we're saying, they're asking us for more money. And we say, we can't in good faith do this. It's just not common sense, unless we can have more collateral. We, we end up on uh, you know, a borrower that has, um, you know, I don't know, it's probably seven, $8 million loan out with us ended up coming up giving us another $10 million worth of boot collateral. Well, okay, we can maybe see by funding extra now that you've given us extra collateral. So it's really case by case, but um, you know, we're certainly not going to throw good money after bad, and I don't think any lender is. I think private lenders can be a little bit more aggressive and do things like say what 
collateral do you have inside or outside the company? Let me help me help you. But we're not just going to go say I'm going to double down on on ugly. Makes sense. Well, let's let's hit up the questions that we're getting in here. Maybe Adam, this is for you. How do you see IP valuations coming in, and do you expect those to have a similar 30, 25 to thirty percent decline that you've seen in some of the uh, the fixed assets you've looked at? Adam, you're still muted. I hit it once. I'm sorry. Um, I think it depends on the kind of IP. I mean, if it's a consumer products brand that is tied to a retail chain that hasn't been opened in months, I mean, you could see a significant decline there. But if it's an IP that's like an e-commerce customer list or something, I mean, those can you know those can actually have more value depending on you know depending on what you know what the list is comprised of. So it it's really a case by case basis. I mean, it's it's tough to say that there's a general, you know, a general rule of thumb on it. Um, you know, some are going to do better than others. And I appreciate that. And Eric, this la this next one's for you. And this is a very technical question. I, I so it says, in regards to the CARES Act, specifically EIDL loans, how have lenders been dealing with collateral priority with the SBA and balancing protecting themselves from a priority and intercreditor perspective with getting much needed liquidity to their clients? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'm going to answer it very non-technically, um, but it's, it's, it is a great question. Um, it, you know, I, I think uh, EIDL loans, uh, you know, are typically in the SBA space. I don't do a ton directly there. So I, I you know, to, to the extent that there's a specific overlay with the sort of the backstop or the guarantees with the SBA, um, that's something that I, I don't really know the answer to. I, I can say, though, that generally speaking, the the, the, the programs offered under CARES, including um, the PPP and otherwise, they were rolled out super fast and without a lot of guidance uh, to, to, to the banks or the borrowers. Uh, and a lot of lenders that I've, I've worked with overall, I assume uh, there's some corollaries to this specific program as well, uh, are, are very hesitant because in, in, so, in, in some respects, strongly encouraged to um, you know, to, to, to uh, work with their borrowers, um, you, know, you know, with and for these loans, and certainly it's necessary lifeline in terms of money to keep operating, you know, but there's a forgiveness component to most of these loans that is very uncertain right now. Uh, and there's a process that you have to go through to submit and say that you've qualified for these various programs in order for it to be forgiven. And the issue with respect to the inter, inter creditor issues is, well, what if it's not? So, you know, you're in a situation where you've taken a bunch of money, you've just used it, and then it's not forgiven, and then where does it fall in with respect to, you know, the other loans and, and your other obligations? And that's, that's a problem both on the borrower side as well as on the lender side, because as a lender, you don't want to be in a situation where suddenly you've just been primed by some new money that came in uh, or, you know, or somebody, you know, tries to claw back some, you know, some of your collateral or, or some proceeds of collateral later. And as a borrower, you know, you're in a situation where you desperately need this money and you want it to, to you know, kind of, you know, work for you. But we're in a situation where it's, you know, some of the rules are, are, are not clear. I'm actually dealing right now with a company who's considering paying back their PPP money because they don't, they're, they're, they're concerned that it's not going to be forgiven because uh, they're running through a sale process at the same time. So they receive the money, you know, they are, they, are, they, they are an operating company, but they're about to run through a sale process. They already have a, a you know, a letter of intent and, and they're, you know, working on signing a deal. And a, and a main concern is whether or not um, they're going to be in a situation where at the end of the day, well, what happens if, you know, if I get this money and I sell the company and, and, and then somebody requires me to pay that money back um, as part of the sale process. So a uh, lot, lot of unknowns here. Well, sounds like we're in a very dynamic and uncertain time, which I think we all knew, but hopefully this was helpful to the folks out there and understanding a little bit more what's going on and uh, how to assess specifically collateral, but just the lending, legal, and uh, restructuring environment in general. So I want to thank everybody for, for joining us. I want to thank Opus Connect for having us and sponsoring and uh, operating this, uh, this panel. Lena, I'm not sure 
there's yeah. an official sign off, but. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys again, panelists and Dan for moderating. Uh, we appreciate you guys and your contributions. Thank you to our sponsors, of course. Thank you for all of our attendees. We had over 100 attendees listening, so we appreciate that. We do have another webinar coming up next Tuesday on business planning strategies, so look out for information on that. Um, but we hope you all stay, stay safe and well, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. And thank you to the panelists as well. Yeah. Bye. Thanks.